And we're live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Mindset Podcast. This is episode 99, helping you flex your mind, body, and soul. And today's special guest, his second time on the Mindset Podcast, is Todd Nyholm. Todd Nyholm and I had our last episode, would have been September 22nd, or September 9th, 2022. So it's been a minute. And not only has it been a minute, Todd's been working behind the scenes on some very, very interesting stuff. And as you all know, the mindset brand is all about brain and body performance. And that's why I like to bring on guests that are experts in this in, in these fields. And Todd and I have uh, kind of reconnected again, if you will. And I've been watching it on his socials. He's been really working a, a lot, really hard behind the scenes. And he's created a book, What the Bleep Brain, that just got released fe- February 23rd. Uh, of this year, just uh, what is that? Or sorry, yesterday, yesterday, yeah, February twenty second. So, yeah. Todd, welcome back to the Mindset Podcast for the second time. Happy to have you on the show, and let's 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 dive right into it. Let's let's talk about. Let's start off by talking about your journey to writing this book because I've been watching your TikToks, watching your to- your content. This has been a long, a long game, a long haul goal, and there's been a lot of things in between that have led to this point. So welcome back to the show and let's dive right into it. Awesome. I'm so glad to be here, man. I enjoy talking to you and I've been watching your stuff too. And we're really in the same kind of path, I think, you know? Yeah. So my journey is is quite long. You know, I started working on some of these methods when I was a kid. Um, and so I've been putting something together that I could really make work for myself to help fix some problems with my health, some traumatic experiences that I went through. And now I'm trying to teach that to everyone that it, it helped me so much. I'm trying to get it to as many people as I can as quickly as I can. No, absolutely. And you talk a lot about some different modalities for people to think a little bit differently. And one of them that I wanted to touch on was because you've got a couple of different, again, these are brain focused, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let's talk about like the brain gym or the, yeah, the brain gym, right? We're yeah. talking about improving your your brain's cognition, uh, the balance, the flexibility, um, simple simple movements, right? That stimulate different parts of the brain. So why don't you, we why don't we ex- explain that to our listeners? Like what exactly that is, and you know, kind of how it all works. Yeah, it's kind of interesting if you can figure out how your body works as well as different parts of you. You can use them to stimulate different parts of your brain, and sort of vice versa. So you can end up like using your body to help your brain work better. And vice versa. We tend to go from like mind to body. And so in some of this, we're going from body to mind. So as opposed to psychosomatic, we're going uh, somatopsychic, which is a term probably no one's ever heard before. But ultimately, we're trying to do some of that so that we can encourage the brain to be more healthy and flexible. And so I tried to make some really specific methods that, you know, anyone could start with and kind of build on top of to create a, like a daily program to work with. No, totally. And I remember uh, thinking back to our last episode, uh, back September 2022, we were mainly talking, we were talking a little bit about the brain, but we were also talking a lot about the psychology behind diet, right? Remember about dieting and how we eat, why we eat, why we emotionally eat. So, you know, going back to your new book, it's very, very much so focused on the brain and how we can change that internal hard wiring um, in our brain to create more neuroplasticity, right? Which a lot of people, you know, don't realize that the brain, we in our brain, we can create new neural pathways. And with your techniques, um, I feel like, you know, a lot of people just, it's the simplest stuff that we, that has always been there behind the scenes, like these, these tried and true principles, but people just kind of tend to forget our breath, right? When we're, when we have accelerated breath, when we're constantly, you know, like in our fight or flight, our sympathetic nervous system, right? Um, I feel like that, you know, being in that, 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 uh, that, you know, fight or flight uh, mentality, it, uh, it really, it just really um, is difficult for a lot of people, right? And a lot of people are still mainly in that state. So your books, teachings, teach people to learn how to transition from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that, like with with your techniques of like, um, is it for your techniques from your book, would you say that someone can implement these in like as little as let's say 10 minutes a day kind of a thing? Like just very small incremental progression? 
Yeah, absolutely. I tried to set it up that way so anyone could start and do it in a short window because we're all so busy and, you know, people got families and work and all kinds of things they're doing. So how do you make it simple enough that anyone can start and work their way through it? Because so many people are jammed up in that sympathetic nervous system or they're just it's like this button is pushed in their brain that they can't unpush. So I tried to make a series of methods that they could learn to unpush it, get their brain states to change so that they can enter a different brain state and start to feel a little different from there. But in a way that's easy to do that you could do anywhere. You could do it in your car, you could do it at work, you can do it in the shower, you could do it in bed, you know, so I tried to make them like really easy and something that anyone could access and then talk about it in such a way that it's like I'm having a conversation in the book. So it makes it really easy to grasp. At least that's my hope. No, absolutely. And you talk, you were just touching on it uh, briefly there about in, in, in your book, it's called the brain, the brain reset, right? Where we're trying to get out of our mind and into our body, right? That transition from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic. And, I, and what I was learning how to do, I'd say in the last two years, which you talk about in your book and is a big proponent in your book is breath work, right? Changing yeah. our breathing, slowing down our breathing. Because like, for instance, when I meditate and I'm not, you know, focusing on the breath work, you know, in conjunction with the meditation, I find it less effective, right? Because I'm the thoughts are still racing, right? So yeah. it, it gives us kind of a, an internal cue, right? We're using our breath as an internal cue to sit to signal to our brain, hey, we can slow things down. We don't have to be, you know, like monkey. We don't have to have the monkey mind going going everywhere, here, there, and everywhere. We oh, can yeah. we can use our breath to really hone in on slowing things down and really that transition from sympathetic to parasympathetic. So, yeah, I really, I really like how you really like touch on that. Like that's like that book by james nestor like breathe or breath mm -hmm. right and that's oh, yeah. it's it's such a big you know it's such a big thing that we just un, like we we overlook and it's so simple it's our it's our how we breathe yeah and it's such an easy useful tool right because you have it with you all the time and one of the cool things about breath is it's both voluntary and involuntary so it gives you this access to your nervous system that is hard to get any other way and you put it in conjunction with some meditation techniques or some mindfulness techniques or um, different ways of working with your brain, you can really create this interesting synergy of effects so that you can stack them together. And the cool thing about the breath, like I said, is it's with you all the time. And you, if you watch it yourself, you'll see how you're doing in different situations relative to what your breath is doing. And do you use any kind of like, uh, uh, like aura ring or Fitbit or Apple watch or anything like that to kind of measure your, your heart rate and be like, Whoa, 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 Whoa. I gotta, I gotta slow things down. I'm feeling too like elevated today. Or, or do you just, you don't use any, um, smart watches or anything like that. Do you, or do you just kind of, you know, listen to your body and then be like, okay, if I need a minute, like time out, I'm going to take time. Yeah, I have a smartwatch, but I don't use it for that. You know, I'm more interested in tracking my steps and what my heart is doing, doing over time. I, at this point, I just feel it. I've been working on these things for so long. Like I'm, I've gotten fairly in tune with that because I kind of needed to to get through some of the health problems. So for the most part, you know, I, I just feel my way through it. That may not be the easiest place to start, especially if you're really busy and, and you haven't done much of that work. And so any tool you can use to kind of get yourself into a different state or to remind yourself, sometimes you just need a timer. It's like, oh, I got to do this thing now or a timer to do this thing later, you know? And so the watch is great for that. No, totally. And um, like, I find w when I'm meditating, I like to have a timer too. Like, cause the, once the meditation, I use this Oak app, it's called, it's like O-A-K, Oak. And it's a yeah. free app, it's like Headspace. Um, Headspace charges now, but whatever. <laughs> I was I was using using their app for many years, but then I came across Oak, and then it's just it's so simple, and you can change all the different background sounds, right, to like rain and river and and um and whatever you want, and like doing that, they they have, they have you can do custom, like you can meditate for a full day if you want, or days or hours or minutes or whatever you want. Yeah. But, in that app, um, once I get it going, once I pick like, you know, five minutes or up to 30 or an hour, um, I always put on my clock as well. Cause I noticed that, you know, you'll, cause I have these bells that go off every five minutes just to let me know, like to refocus if I'm getting distracted. Yeah. So, it, so, which is really helpful, right? You got to figure out what works for you. Absolutely. Um, and then some days I'll do unguided and then other days I'll do guided. So when I'm feeling very, you know, monkey mind, distracted, scatterbrained, I'll do um, the, uh, 
guided meditations and then I'll do unguided. Like, cause like I, I've been falling off it. I've been on it and off it a little bit. I, I was really consistent. And then I've just been trying to get back into it again. So I think that's a big trick. A lot of that is like, how do you make it consistent so that you just keep going back to it? And that's an interesting thing. Just like stack it in your life somewhere. So like, okay, I take a shower every day. So I'll do it right before I shower. So there's no way to forget, you know, and that works most of the time. It's like any little trick to get it into your life so that it becomes part of what you do. And there's no way to forget it. And because there's a lot of people that, you know, they do like two months really well and then 10 months of nothing. And then they don't think it works for them, you know, because they didn't do enough to kind of rewire how their, how their brain is working. You know? Yeah, no, for sure. And do you, uh, when, when you say you meditate, like, do you meditate in the, do you prefer meditation in the morning or do you find it like more effective for yourself, like in the evening, like before you shower? I do different ones at different times in the day. So I get up and before I get out of the bed, I do a series of methods. And then in the middle of the day, and then when I get home, I do some. So I, I kind of do a lot at this point. And then before I go to bed, I often do some. Um, and I have different, so I have so many methods that I've made. I used them at different parts of the day um, to have different impact. So. Yeah. Right on. Right on. Yeah. Because I'm always, I'm always open to different uh, ways of meditating because I've been utilizing meditation, God, for seven years now on and off um, and just experimenting. And I started with three minute sessions because I was so right. Cause it's a new experience. Like a lot of people, oh, yeah. you know, once you're in it and you're just trying to not focus on anything for three minutes, you're like, right. holy, my brain's noisy. <laughs> So like over time though, I've learned to be like, like you said, like be kind to those thoughts. It's okay to, right? Like the, the way that they describe it in the guided meditation is like your thoughts are floating by like clouds and some of them are going to have going to be a lot larger clouds than others and a little stormier and then other ones will be more blissful, right? But yeah. over time, no matter how intense those clouds are, which are your thoughts, um, over time, you just learn how to, be, be at peace with them and, and adapt to them right yeah and a lot of people think they're not good at meditation because they start and they try to do five minutes and they get like through eight seconds and then they can't go any farther you know and it's like no no that's the process you got to start there you're doing the exact right thing that you're meant to be doing you know and so then the thoughts they're going to come up and they're going to keep coming up and emotions too and then emotions and thoughts and it'll be this kind of storm and that's the process at the beginning because you become aware of it and you start to understand you're there and then you have your thoughts and you have your emotions and they start to become a little separate and then you can do more with them. And then the thoughts get quieter and the emotions get quieter. And then you'll have these peaks where they're huge again, and then they'll get quieter. And after a while you can, you can learn the right thing so that it just becomes completely quiet. And the first time you have that kind of experience, you're like, Oh, that's where a lot of this was heading, you know? And that's pretty cool. I, I did get to that point. So the longest meditation I've done in one session was an hour. And I yeah. had to, of course, I had to work my way up to it. It took me like probably six months or three to three to five months, something like that. But yeah. like, holy smokes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Like it was just after like I was transitioning from one job to the next. Uh, we were on our way to Hawaii and there's absolute turmoil on our way to Hawaii because um, it, we went during Christmas, right? Which don't recommend doing. If you're going <laughs> to travel, right. do not travel during the, the, the rush. The biggest sure. rush of the year where everyone wants to leave. Yeah. But anyway, we did it. And it was like snowmageddon. It was on the news and everything. How bad it was. Everyone was like stranded. We were at the airport for 30 plus hours. And That's the rough. only thing that kept just, well, kept me going especially was I was meditating consistently every single day. No ifs, ands, or buts. No matter if I did in the morning or at night for like half an hour. Yeah. 20, 20 minutes minimum. And that helped me navigate that intense, like you're talking about Trump, like, I wouldn't say it was a trauma, but it was like, it was a difficult experience, right? Which, you know, our, all of our, the family's anxiety was like sky high and, and you're, you're just in a, in a very uh, uh, sympathetic state where you're just like, holy smokes, is this, is this ever going to end? Because yeah. we, we had to sleep at the airport. And then by the time, you know, everyone's flights were getting canceled. It was snowing like a foot outside the airport. And then by the time we actually were about to leave, then they had to de-ice the, uh, de the plane. And we were like, yeah. and then I'm like, you know, my, my wife's just like, oh, like, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to go, we're going to go. And I'm like, yeah, I know we're going to go, but just until we're in the air, like, no, don't say anything. So we made it there thank god but my goodness it's just when you have when you're in when you're in it and you're in the thick of it, it it's it's definitely challenging but that's why 
the lessons, the, 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 the teachings in your book, people need to utilize these kinds of uh, methods because like it can, you can, you can utilize these methods and tools and taught the book for as little it in under five minutes a day, right? Like even less than that, two minutes, let's just say under two minutes, right? Because a lot of people are worried that they can't put something in, into implementation that's too long, right? Oh, yeah. start off, but with that little amount of time, it'll still help. Those are the, like you're talking about, like habit stacking. Those are the incremental building blocks, right? That are going to help people, so. Yeah, absolutely. And some of them are short enough that you can do in 90 seconds. And then if you want to, you can stack them all together and take an hour to do them because you're feeling good. And, and the practice comes from doing them all the time. So when you're stuck in that situation, it's like you already have the tool set inside to deal with it. That's one of the hard things that sometimes for me to get across to people. It's like if you do it all the time, when those things come up, it's like you have tools for it and you're able to control the situation quite a bit better, which is one of the great benefits that come from practicing it. But even if you did two minutes a day for a year, you'd have an amazing benefit over time. Oh, absolutely. And because yeah. I was just looking back at my my meditation sessions and I think I'm at like almost 900 total. That's yeah. over the last. So that's what I think about, right? Like, sure, I've fallen off of it a bit, but volume wise, the, it's a, it's become a practice. It's become a habit, right? I like it's just like you brush. You got to brush your teeth. You don't feel right when you don't brush your teeth. You don't right. feel right when you don't shower. And so that's, you know, what Todd talks about in his book, ladies and gentlemen, is we want to integrate it into our life as little or as much as you know we feel comfortable with. yeah and there's lots of ways to start and go through it and then you're going to fall off sometimes and one of the big things is to not beat yourself up you know that's not useful at all so if you yeah. miss five days just come back to it like okay it's just tuesday we'll do it today you know don't don't get hard on yourself you know? and um uh, going back to some of uh, the other uh, aspects of your book todd how do you define the vital brain method and what are some of its main benefits for the readers? Yeah, so the Vital Brain Method, the first part of it is in this book. And then I'll have to put it into a couple more um, books because it's kind of long. But it's a way of like literally going through the different pieces of your brain and your central nervous system. And then down into some of the hormonal, the glandular centers and things like that further down in. So that it's it really gives you a whole tool set to reset your brain like you would a computer. So you can turn it off and on again. So all the programs kind of turn off. And you can keep them off, which is great for helping with all kinds of immune system disorders and trauma and anxiety and depression. But when you get really good at it, you start to just feel more and more amazing. So it's like you can turn it all off and back again. And you just start to feel extraordinary, like almost a little bit high without a drug, you know, which is an amazing feeling. And that's it takes a little while to get to that. You got to learn how to turn everything off and then kind of get everything quiet, get the trauma to calm down a little bit. Um, and then you can build up from that. So the vital brain was just a way of describing how good it feels after you've learned all the methods and you've practiced them for a while. It uh, sort of changes every minute of the day because you just feel so much better than most of the people around you. And it's simple enough. I do it often like walking at the park or even walking around a mall. No one knows you're doing it. You know, you can do it inside and you just start to feel better and better and better over time. At first, it's kind of calming everything down. And then after that, it's like really starting to pick you up so that your brain feels kind of vital and you just sort of feel alive and, and pretty good from there. That's awesome. And I know it, all of our listeners want to be able to feel like, you know, they they can do that 180 re mental reset, right? Because we all have that ability. It's just how we do it might be a little bit different from person to person, right? Of like what what can help us change our our inner state and um one other thing i want to mention was you know you said it was this has been a lifelong project a lifelong goal to write this book right is and, and this collection of your inner wisdom and your you navigating your traumas your life experience all you know coupled together and things that you had to learn along the way to make you think better make you feel better and 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 help you find ways to um, be in that kind of like more optimal state right and maintain that consistency of that optimal state so what would you say are some of the challenges or difficulties that you faced or overcame while writing and publishing your book yeah so the first challenge was putting it all together you know because i couldn't find a methods anywhere that could do what I needed it to, which was sort of overcoming Lyme disease and some chronic disease issues. And I knew a crazy serial killer when I was a kid and there's some traumas that went with that. And I, I briefly mentioned it a little bit in the book, but not a ton. Later on, I'll talk more about that. And so I needed something strong enough to overcome all that. And so I made a whole series of methods that build together, like going through university to 
to completely heal as, as best as I could from those things. So once I made the methods, then it was like, okay, how do I explain these things that I've made that have no names? And I pieced them together from lots of different um, methods and scientific journals. And, and a lot of it was just my own stuff to glue it all together. And I'm like, okay, how do I start to talk about this? And how do I teach it? And so the first book was like, here, how do I learn how to write? I'll start with diet because a lot of people are struggling with that and we'll give them a method. And then with this one, it took me a couple of years to describe everything. And when I first wrote the book, I gave it to one of the editors and he looked at it and he said, you know, I have a doctorate from Harvard in editing and you're talking over my head. You need to break this down a lot. So I rewrote the whole thing because I, I think I assume a little too much knowledge, you know, that maybe the average person doesn't have. So that took me a little while to totally rewrite it, put it together in a way that's much easier to understand because I really want to give it. And to people, you know, as quickly as I can and in a way that they can do it and not feel overwhelmed. So that was a big part of the challenge, too, just to get it to publish yesterday was kind of a huge feat for me. You know, oh, so. absolutely. And it's yeah. a journey. It's a journey to get to 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 like to do to like publish a book, like a traditionally published book. Right. Like and like I'm someone that I would love like I'm I, I'm kind of a hybrid. Right. I want to go the traditional. Like I would definitely want to write a book. But I think I might go the route of doing an ebook or a yeah. series of smaller ebooks and use that experience to better my writing and just get better at writing. Cause I'm someone that really like it, writing, sitting down and like my thoughts are all over the place. Right. And I know yeah. most people that write books, like it, they're, they're in the same boat too. But I would rather start really small, build a foundation off those little mini ebooks, make a series and then go with it and then eventually write yeah exactly put it all together into one yeah yeah and I, I don't even sit down to write most of the time I often like walk and I'll stop and type out something on my phone or dictate it oh but you may be okay. like me like you, I never yeah. did well I can't say I never did it but I rarely yeah. sat down and said yeah. hey I'm writing right now you know and if you can kind of piece it together in different ways that really helps yeah. the writing process yeah know? totally totally especially if you're on a walk that's a great idea yeah it works great for me again yeah, yeah totally totally um and like, what would you say, what would you say are, are uh, some of the future projects or plans that you have in relation to your book or your work as a somatic th uh, therapist and brain trainer? Yeah, so I'm building a digital course for the methods in the book. So some of them get a little complicated to pick up off a page. And so I started making some like a video course that I'll put up um, on one of the platforms, probably Experienceify, so I can walk people through them and then give them videos where they can do it with me. So I'm walking them through it in the video form because um, I noticed a lot of people are tripping over trying to pick it up from the writing. So because I like books, you know, it works pretty well for me and I kind of assume that other people will do. And then I give it to my friends and they're like, I can't figure it out from the text. And so if I walk them through, it's like, oh, that's what you mean. And so I'm trying to give people, you know, multiple options. So that'll be a video course and I'm maybe a quarter of the way filming it. So it should be out in a few weeks, I think. And then people can walk their way through it and email me if they're in the course. So it gives you a little bit more direct access to me if you have questions about it. So that's the next big step. Right on, right on. Um, and any, if you're doing any snippets on social, I'll help repost those for you on my, on all my socials too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Anytime someone's writing a book or, or they just came out with a book or a course, I want to, I want to help you guys out as much as, as much as you can. Cause like, yeah, I just, I, I love, I love making connections, like, you know, connections with my podcast guests and, uh, and it's, you know, it just, and then it gets the mindset brand out there too. Oh yeah. And we can share for each other, you know, and build it up and help people get tools and get the things that are hard to find, you know, and the more we can put it out there and put it out there together and bring more people to it. That's fantastic. You know? No, for sure. And then what would you say are some of the ancient wisdoms that you draw from in your book uh, and how do they complement the modern scientific knowledge about the brain? Yeah. So when I was trying to figure everything out, I was reading ancient yogic texts and things about Tai Chi and martial arts and even some Viking training and some of the stuff from the Middle East. And if you look at it and you really, you get, you dig into it, they use wording that is sometimes you have to go through that sounds kind of almost mystical. But if you go through it, you can see that they're talking about something that you can do and then put it together. And you realize that they really understood a lot of this very well. And they kind of hid how they taught it and they kind of hid it in places and you can put it back together. And the cool thing about combining that with like the modern stuff is the modern research gets really specific in terms of how the body functions and how the neurotransmitters work and how the glandular secretions work and how the mind 
changes or the brain states change when you do different things. So when you put it together, you get sort of these thousands of years of how they did it with lots of stuff going on now to describe it, which I think makes it much easier for modern people, particularly in the West, to kind of understand it in a different way. Yeah, because it I know sometimes when you're reading ancient scriptures and stuff like that, like 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 you know, from the 1600s or beyond, you're just like, what did I just read? <laughs> You find stuff from like 5,000 years ago. And there was a time I was looking at something like, oh, this is the answer I need. And I just read it until I figured out, oh, they're trying to get this change to happen through changing how your ear, like you, how you hear sounds around you. And once I figured that out, it made a huge difference in what I was trying to do. But it was, it was from India. It was, you know, 2,500 years before, you know, BC. So it was a long time ago, you know, and it was super helpful. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And super old. <laughs> I want to, another thing I want to mention was, uh, I, cause I know you just came out with your, with your book, what, what the bleep brain, but some of your other books that you've written, have you had any success testimonials of some of your readers or people that, you know, maybe friends, family, colleagues that have used some of your methods that you've learned along the way. And you've just told them like, Hey, I'm, I'm experimenting with these tools and tactics. They've really helped me. You want to, you know, I want to show you how to do it. Have you, and did you, did you get that opportunity to show people how to do it? Or did, did you have people read your books that kind of took that advice and then be like, Hey, Todd, this is like been a game changer for me. Yeah, definitely. And I test everything with my clientele or with my friends um, before I put it even into a book form. And so with the new methods, I had a group of students in Europe that I taught and they were, they were so amazed about it. They were a little nervous for me coming back to America when I started to teach it because they thought I might ruffle too many feathers because um, it helped their depression and their anxiety and their trouble sleeping and their ability to feel, you know, really good. And so they even kind of warned me, they're like, don't you want to do this in Europe? You'll be a little safer from, you know, some of the things that happen in our country, you know, in terms of uh, pharmaceuticals and things. And that was their worry. I don't think it's justified. You know, they have a different view of America, certainly than I would have here. But the point was, they got so much out of it. They were like, have you thought about this a little bit? And so I do have, you know, a series of, you know, testimonials. And I, I put a few of them in the book um, so that people can see. And I'll, I'll talk more about them as they go. I think the main ones are, you know, some of the obvious stuff is bringing down anxiety, helping with depression, um, getting your mind so that one of the things I heard the most was, people felt like they got some distance between their mind and their emotions. So that helped them regulate quite a bit. So it didn't feel like their mind was on top of them or their emotions were on top of them. And that was a great place to start, you know? No, totally. Cause like talk, yeah, talk. That's a really good way to put it. The distance between our mind and our emotions, like learning, learning how to, uh, maybe not length, maybe not lengthen the gap, but maybe shorten the gap. So you're just, you're not, you're not feeling like, um, I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe to lengthen the gap a little bit, right? So you're just not feeling like your, your, your mind and your, your thoughts are just like too muddled. You're, you have, it just helps create more clarity and then more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? More, more clarity and more, yeah, peace, more peace. Yeah. yeah, and it gives that a little separation so it doesn't kind of own you, right? It's almost like instead of having this TV in your face, you get it like a couple feet away from me. Yeah, you're like, yeah. You're watching your mind rather than having your mind beat you up a little bit or your emotions, you know, and you can get yeah. both of those to change. And it really changes how life feels to you, kind of on, definitely on the inside. Yeah. You don't you don't feel like you're on a men mental hamster wheel as much. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's uh, that's all the time that we got for tonight, Todd. I would love to do another episode with you, or maybe even two, over awesome. the next little while. We can we can rebook another one. Um, Let's do it because there's there's lots to dig into, right? This is such a very broad area, and I know our listeners would love to hear more because Great. it's just it's so so in depth, right? And everyone needs to know different uh, tools and tactics to improve their brain their brain sure. health and then, and, and their body, right. Brain and body performance. So where are you most active on right now and where can our listeners find and purchase your book? Yeah. So the book is everywhere. It's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. It's on um, KDP and Kobo. It's, it's a bunch of places, you know, my website is nitality.com. So I originally called the system the Nihome Vital Life Method because my last name is Nihome and it's too long. So we shortened it to Nitality. So it's nitality, N-Y-T-A-L-I-T-Y.com. And so you can find me there. I'm building a YouTube channel and a TikTok and trying to get as much stuff out there as I can. You know, if you've seen some of the, the shorts and I'll do a little bit longer stuff with that as well. Um, yeah, those are the good places to find me, I think. 
Right on. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the Mindset Podcast again, Todd. And I'm looking forward to getting this, releasing this episode out to the world so everyone can learn, learn from you, learn from your tools and tactics and purchase and read What the Bleep Brain. Awesome. Right I appreciate on. it. Yeah. I'm just going to go like this.